So welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. You know, I'm really looking forward to today's guest. We've been trying to get her on and you're gonna be so excited. She's a life coach for dogs and their people. And this is Tamar Geller. She works with so many celebrities, I can't keep track of them, including Oprah, Ellen, Kelly Ripka, and Ben Affleck. Now, many of you know I own dogs, uh, usually a lot of them. And going for a walk or a run with them is really, I think, the most peaceful and centering parts of my day. And I've written a lot about this. So today we're going to talk about the health benefits dogs provide you and what you can do to keep them healthy. And I understand that you actually eat mostly plant paradise. Absolutely. Style. Is that true? I'm a huge fan of your work. Oh my. I'm a huge, 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 huge fan. And you know, I've been eating like that way for a long time, but nobody was corroborating what I was feeling because I grew up in the Middle East, grew up in Israel. So then you came with your information and ta-da! So that's the end of our show today. Thank you very much. Thank now, you. <laughs> so speaking of Israel, you, you were a uh, Army intelligence officer. I was intelligence officer with the elite special forces, yes. And I was focusing on behavior, yeah. So you were trying to get the troops to behave or? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's really funny because if you think about Osama bin Laden, the way they caught him, it was the delivery guy who was delivering his medicine that that's how the tract where he was staying. My job was to pay attention to the unimportant people and to pay attention to their behaviors. So I was completely nobody's important paying to the unimportant people because oftentimes these are the key to do or undo a mission. So... So how do you go from there <laughs> to, uh, to listening to dogs? You're not a dog whisperer, no, right? You're no. a dog listener. listener. So yes. uh, how, do you, how do you do that? You know, Dr. Gandhi, it's one of the most incredible things in life because what happened to me, I had a dream. I never intended to work with dogs. I like dogs. I was not a dog lover. I was a dog liker. And I thought I, I had a plan to become a therapist and to focus on Holocaust survivors and all of that, because that's my family, and I really wanted to understand my family. And then I had a dream when I was helping research of wolf behavior and bird behavior in the desert, and the dream said, you must work with dogs. And it really rattled me, but I still didn't know how to go about it. You know, I'm a nobody in Israel. And life started happening for me, and one thing led to another, and I came here for a visit, I had the dream of volunteered for a dog trainer for a minute. And one thing just introduced me to people. I became the resident dog expert for the Today Show. Simon & Schuster chased me down to write a book about my method. Oprah, my beloved angel, called the CEO of Simon & Schuster, said, I want to launch her book. And the rest is history. But I really didn't do it. I really truly believe that there are bigger forces that support each one of us. If we're really going for what our calling is, and we're serving the greater good. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So you just put it out there. Yes. And I mean, did a dog show up on your doorstep or? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, 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 the detail how it happened is I was already a meditator. At age 19, I changed my diet and I became a meditator. And I went to listen to a lecture on uh, meditation and I walk into a room full of people and I didn't know anybody and there was a dog in the corner. So I went to talk to the dog because I just finished studying wolves in the wild and their behavior, which was completely mind opening. And I went and I interacted with him and the guy who was giving the lectures came running, Tamar, you can't talk to the dog, you can't be with him, he's not nice to people. Meanwhile, the dog and me are French kissing. So we became friends and at one point he needed somebody to go to Southeast Asia to take pictures of Sri Lanka and Singapore, places that I would find interesting because he was trying to reach my generation. I was in my 20s. And he sent me there in my ticket. You're and now then, in your 30s, right? Thank you. Thanks to your diet, I'm in my 50s. <laughs> We're de-aging, yes, you know, that's I agree the whole with idea. That. Well, that's your new book. Yeah, it's the new book. That's, that's your right. new book coming out. Longevity Paradox. I know, right? I hope it has my picture on it. <laughs> Anyhow, so instead of going for two weeks to Southeast Asia, I ended up staying a year. So when I came to the United States, instead of staying just for a week, I ended up staying 30 something years now. Wow. Following, it just one thing led to another. 
I truly just had the, the dream that would not leave me alone. You know, that's a, it's a great point because on the way over here, I was listening to an album from Ibiza. Uh-huh. And, Ibiza. Ibiza, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they, uh, there's this ongoing rap through this song of Obama giving one of his speeches to kids. Oh. And basically, he says in this speech, you have to get an education and you're going to be great. All of us have a talent. Yes. No matter how you know little or how big, all of us have a unique talent. Yes. And it's your job to find that talent and foster it. And I don't yes. care what your talent is, yes. but you have one. Yes. And it, this is in a rap song and Obama's how voice. Beautiful. So on the way over here and you just found so, your talent. So when the first time I stayed with Oprah, she taught me about what just happened that you just listened to it and I just talked about it. Oprah talked me that it's called God's Wink. And the first time I stayed with her, she put a little book by my bed and she came in the morning and she said, did you read that book? And I said, no. And she said, read it. And she sat at the foot of my bed and waited. She is such a magnificent, caring human being. And, and it talks about the synchronicities or the unimportant things that all of a sudden sync with something else within a short period of time. And what it is, if we walk around life recognizing those God winks, there's a, we're part of a magic. It's almost like Einstein when he said, either you see everything is a miracle or nothing at all. Very true. So how do you go through life? Are you look at your talent that is not important enough or you look at the talent that Obama was talking about and you realize, no, that is my way to contribute to the tapestry of life that we're all a part of. No, ab absolutely, very you know? true, yeah. So that was beautiful that we just had a God's wink, you and me. There you go. So, okay, getting back to dog, let's get to your <laughs> talent. So what makes your you know, training so unique? You're not a dog whisperer. No, uh, no, so here's what it is. I do not believe in obedience. I do not believe in obedience. And the reason why is if you think about it, nobody gets a dog because they want more obedience in their life. <laughs> Everybody gets a dog because they want more love in their life. We have science, and I'm a big believer in science, and science shows us that dogs, cognitively and emotionally, are very much like a human toddler. And the way we raise children today is no longer the way we did in the 1950s, which is about obedience. True. If we know that they are like dog, that they are like human toddler, and we change the way they raise kids into empower the kid to find their own talent, to be the best version of themselves, then that's what I do with the dog. I look at the dog and I'm saying, how can I serve you and serve your dog parents? Meaning, how, what is your gift? Where are the uh, weaknesses that I need to heal you, to help you, so you can be the best, kind of like what you're doing with food. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I'm doing, which you're doing too, you're not looking, when somebody comes to you with a problem, you're not looking at that problem. You're looking at the hole. Yesterday, somebody came to me with a puppy nine weeks old, and she said, all I need is housebreaking. Two hours later, we didn't even start with housebreaking because what we found out right away is the dog has fear of even stepping from here to you. He was completely terrified. And I said, what we need to teach the dog is life skills, how not to be afraid. Because if a dog is afraid, your life is not gonna turn out the way you want more than if your dog is not housebroken. We will get to the housebreaking, but right now, it's kind of like you, as a physician, you have to prioritize mm -hmm. what's the first most important thing, and that's what I do from an holistic point of view. So it's completely not dog training as usual. Just like you, what you're not doing, what you're doing is not. So are, are you person training secretly, or? Well, that's what Oprah that'll said to me. That'll be your little secret, or? <laughs> I truly don't see myself qualified to tell anybody about their life. I know everybody is now a life coach. I do not see myself qualified for that. But what has happened is when I introduce people to a different way of looking at their dog and assessing situation and looking at the diet as a contributor, contributor to how we feel and how we behave, then all of a sudden they're starting to say, wait a minute, I tried it with my husband. I tried it with my wife. I tried it with my children. So just by them practicing it with their dog, all of a sudden it's a tool that works and then they're trying to tune in other aspects of their life. But I'm not coming from a place of let me teach you. I'm not. 
is there a right dog or a wrong dog for some for somebody? I actually agree with that. And it's not about a breed. It's about your lifestyle. So right now I'm dealing with a husky, puppy husky, very, very hyper, that they got for an 11-year-old boy with severe ADHD. Mm. And they want the kid to, you know, teach the dog. And it's like taking two dynamites, yeah. you know, and expecting not to be explosive. And it's not gonna work. It's just not gonna work. And it breaks my heart because that husky with a person who gonna exercise them, who gonna hike them, who gonna, you know, be there for them, that husky gonna be phenomenal. But right now is the wrong combination. It's kind of like dating. It's not that the dog is wrong, just like with dating, it's not that the person is wrong. It's just who is the best matching for your lifestyle, for your values, for your time management. That's what I'm looking to see. How can I match? Because not all Labradors are the same. You have two golden doodles. Uh, Labradors, Labradors, yeah. They're not the same personality. No. You know, and that's kind of like... You know, I mean, one is mellow and laid back, kind of very Yodish, big 85-pound Labradoodle. Yeah. And the other one is just a little dynamo and, you know, wants to play constantly. And, you know, if I'm sitting on the couch in the morning, she's sitting there batting my hand. <laughs> For attention. Know, yeah, saying, come on, you know, stop. You know, chup, chup. Yeah, come on, let's go. Chup, chup. And, I'll, you know, I'll say, no, not right now. <laughs> no, come on. Yeah. And the other yes. one's just sitting there going, you know. So that's what I'm trying to teach people. Don't go by a breed. Let's get rid of the nonsense of a breed. Let's look of, of the individuals. And that's why I would really like people to get a little bit older dog, preferably from a rescue, preferably fostering, so you can date the dog and see if it makes sense if that dog is a good one for a marriage. Oh, I love that. So we're going to dog date? Yes, just like you date to see if you can marry that person, if you can deal with their issues. Because we know the things that work out, but what about the things that we disagree with? You know, I mean, I love your story when you told about your wife when she went to menopause and you were freezing your butt in that hotel. <laughs> and it's kind of like- Very oh, true. Do you know what I mean? You, if it's forever, you, would, you may not be able to sleep in the same bedroom and ultimately it's gonna impact your marriage. Yeah, so you right. gotta look at things. Is it a temporary issue or is it a permanent issue? Whether it's with a person, whether it's with a dog. So, uh, and so a lot, a lot of uh, shelters will let you foster a dog shelters, for a period no. of time? Shelters, no. no, but rescue organization. And they have rescue organizations that are rigid, and you have rescue organizations that are benevolent. So it's kind of like with anything else. You have to find the benevolent one who would like for the dog to date because most of us who foster dogs, we become... Uh, foster failure, where meaning we keep the dogs. <laughs> my uh, my wife has a very uh, dear friend who fosters dogs, and she'll foster sometimes ten dogs yes. at a time. And yes. she uh, unfortunately has a very large collection of dogs now, and, and she's <laughs> perfectly capable of taking care of them. But That's you're right. Exactly. I think you're right. Most foster families <laughs> unfortunately adopt the dog, which is great. Which is fantastic. Oh, which is great because what it is, they try because to choose a dog based on look. It's like choosing a life mate based on look. It is ridiculous. It but is wait a ridiculous. minute, that's how most people do it, right? It's ridiculous. That's why we have more than 60% uh, divorce rate. And you know, there was just a research. They did a research on loneliness, on people feeling lonely. And 62.5% of people who said they are lonely were married. Hmm. So when you look at that, and again, we already established the dogs have very similar brain to human toddler, meaning they're not different than us then let's not make mistakes with dogs that we make mistakes with people. If you're dumped in a relationship, which we all have, it's heartbreaking. If you're a dog and somebody dumps you in a relationship and you end up in the shelter, you have the label of defective, not that your people where have the issue, it's you have the issue. So you can see I have a lot of work at hand to change the way society label. You know, that's a great point. I'm just finishing a book called The Elephant Whisperer, and I don't know if you know it. The what whisperer? The Elephant, elephant whisperer. whisperer. Interesting. So you, you've got to get this. It's a guy who has a game preserve in, I think, Uganda, but it doesn't really matter. And he uh, didn't have any elephants, and he gets a call from another game preserve saying, we've got a, a family of rogue elephants. They are 
intolerant of humans. They break out, they ravage the villages, blah, blah, blah. And we're going we're gonna to put them down. But any interest in these elephants? And the guy says, uh, yeah, I don't know anything about elephants, but you know, I know a lot about animals. So he, he builds this big elephant area and they break out and they have to go get them. And he yes. says, this is not going to work. And he yes. says, I, this is not a bad animal. Something yes. has made this animal bad. And it turns out that these animals had what witness these people kill two of the oh. matriarchs. Oh. So he basically, yeah. So he basically, basically sat at the edge of this enclosure, camped there with a friend, and every time they made a charge, uh, he would get up and say, "No, no, no! It's just me. You don't have to leave. You're safe here." Yes. He would talk to them, and yes. long story short, they became you know, part of his family. These yes. rogue elephants, and it was all because there was an incident where. For good reason, they distrusted humans. Traumatic, yeah. 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 And he w said, hey, I'm right in your way. In fact, later on in the book, he picks up another rogue elephant, and she literally tries to kill, kill him, him, run him yeah. over. And at the last second, the elephant who he rescued whacked oh her God. and picked her off. And she eventually you know, came around. Wow. But that element sa saved his life. So you see, we don't have to go to Uganda to do it because we have so many dogs with PTSD, with post-traumatic stress disorder that people gave to them under the guise of dog training. And I'm not even faulting people because most people do not know that there's a different way of doing things, which is my method, what it is I look at the dog and how can I help you be everything that you can be, the way you look at the body, the way you look at the human being, versus, you know, let me harness you with medication, with strong medication, with obedience, with choke chain, with prong collars, no, 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 no. Can we all work together to bring each other, you know, to be the whole, to let's get rid of emotional injuries? So, you know, we have a rescue dog, um, and he uh, came to us very late in his life. He actually was found on the streets of uh, Skid Row. In oh, LA. wow. And he was, he was rescued by a, a young man who got busy and couldn't keep him and he was given to his mother who lived out in the desert and she unfortunately recently a couple years ago died of cancer and he looks uh, his name is george and he looks like a wheaton that i had called george who passed away and uh, so george uh, they, she said would you take him i said oh yeah his name's george and how could he's, i not he's, he's half wheaton but he was the most standoffish dog and just didn't become a part of the pack, would never come to you. Um, and so just every day I'd just sit on the floor and, and wait. And as he'd go by, I'd give his ear a little scratch and he'd just keep walking by. Well, eventually now this guy, we've had him for two years. He now comes up, puts his head on my knee and I scratch his head. And we had a thunderstorm a few months ago shaking like a leaf, could not be controlled. I oh. brought him up on the bed. I locked him oh. in my arms. And he finally, with his head just kind of sticking out, <sighs> yeah, fine, and he stopped shaking. And yeah. my wife my wife went, holy cow, you know, this dog is, you know, part of the pack. And, and he's now, you know, trusting in humans for the first time in his life. So it's really, it's really exciting. Uh, Isn't it most soul fulfilling, most fulfilling on the deepest way to help somebody? I, I know I'm getting emotional, but I, I mean, this is what I do, what I do. To see somebody not go through life with that debilitating fear. Yeah, you, you know, know, it just is heartbreaking yeah. to see an innocent animal. And yeah, know, from what I could tell, he had a horrible, you know, he had a horrible life. Yeah. But now we yeah. think he's 16 and we, wow. we kind of adopted him. So yeah, he's at the end of life. Now the idiot go, wants to go for a three mile run every morning and, <laughs> you know, and he, he's there wagging his tail going, okay, let's go. I'm part of the pack. And oh so, my God, how beautiful, yeah. how beautiful. So, so he'll outlive us all. In I the think. name of dogs, <laughs> thank you and your wife. Well, thank you. George. So how did you get your start in your health journey? Let's, let's shift over from <laughs> dogs for a minute. We'll come back to dogs. <laughs> well, you know, again, oftentimes, you know, some of the worst things that happen in our life in retrospect become the best thing in our Very life. Very true. Right? Very true. 
So I was in, an, uh, in, a, in a course to be an intelligence officer for the elite special forces. And I was just, I had high fever all the time and I was miserably tired all the time. Turns out I had mono, but it was misdiagnosed for a long time. And I, the only doctor that helped me was an alternative doctor. And what he did is he changed my diet completely, put me on, it was insane because I was at the hospital for three weeks. I couldn't breathe. I had one lung shot, one lung operating at like 30%. It was terrible because it was so overlooked. And uh, he put me on a diet that it was beyond clean. I mean, it was food combining. It was macrobiotic, no nightshade vegetables. He taught me how to meditate. And he also not to, not to, he told me not to speak to my family, to my parents for one year. My parents sadly, particularly my father had a narcissistic personality mm. disorder, which completely create havoc on your, on your system. I did not know it there. As a matter of fact, I just found that out just like a month ago. Interesting. So I did not even know all of that, but he knew it. But when I was 19, he changed my life. And since I'm 19, I became a meditator. I became completely devoted to knowing more what life is. And a part of it is the way you eat. Part of it is, is to really honor your body and to look at your body as a whole. That's yeah. what meditation, that's what dogs, that's what everything. So I've been on that journey now, you know, for quite a few decades. And that's why I was, that's why I'm a huge fan of yours. These are not empty words because to see the journey that you've been on as a cardiologist and you say enough dealing with the symptom, let's deal with the why, let's deal with the cause. It was phenomenal. And your, your book is the only cookbook that I use. Oh, thank you. You know, I love it. Oh, it's cool. awesome because cool. I can do stuff that I didn't know I could do. Like now I can go back to eating pancakes, which I didn't get to eat for decades yeah. because I'm following, you know, and they your taste recipes. Great. I mean, They're phenomenal. Yeah. They're beyond yummy. Yeah. They're phenomenal. Thank you. Well, you know, that's one of the things we've really tried to do um, is have food that you love, yes. but will love you back. That's exactly. And it, it can be done. I'm, I'm a true follower of, of your work because it is in line with my life's journey and with my work. That's, that's great to hear. No, it's sincere. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, how come celebrities are so attracted to your training? You know, when I wanted to get to know you years ago, it was impossible. And the only way I could get to you is by using my celebrity connections. Yeah. So what happened is celebrities, I think, have the most access to innovation. That's true. And that's what it is, because I work a lot with regular people. As a matter of fact, it's easier for me to work with regular people because they don't have a whole team around them that I need to work. It's usually smaller houses regular schedule, people listen. Celebrities, I can put, you know, that these are my clients and people go, oh, okay. You know, but in reality, I work with everybody and I prefer to work with a common man like me, like you are dog lovers. It's just easier life than with celebrities. But to your answer, just because they have more access to innovation and they want the method that is, you know, gonna connect them to love, because they won't love, they won't. I remember one time I was sitting with Oprah in front of her home in Montecito and, I, and we had a conversation and I said to her, you know, your dogs don't know that, she's, you are, that you're Oprah. And she goes, that's why I love them. And I think celebrities who always get yes people around them know without any shadow of a doubt that the dogs love them, whether their movie was successful or tanked, whether they got 5 million, 20 million for the movie, whether they gained weight or lost weight, Dogs are there for them consistently, genuinely, authentically, without holding back. And I'm the one who connects them and everybody to that part of the dog. I don't want a dog to be obedient to you. I want your dog to be devoted to you. Completely different if the person you're in a relationship with is obedient to you or devoted to you. And I think celebrities who are dealing with so much BS in their life like a dog who is devoted to them because it's true. That's why. Yeah, very true. Uh, I'll tell you a funny dog walking story. I've, I've written about this. Um, when I moved Palm Springs, I was a, a very world famous heart surgeon. Yes. And I was out 
you know, running my dogs through the neighborhood that we'd just moved in, and, and a car pulls up and rolls down the window, and they said, excuse me, are you a dog walker? And, <laughs> and so I came home, and I said, you know, Penny, I can't believe it. You know, I'm recognized everywhere as a world-famous heart surgeon. Now they think I'm a dog walker. She said, you know, this is very good for you. And she, <laughs> she says, I want you to think of yourself as nothing more than a dog walker. And that's a good thing. And I've written about it in my, in my books. It, you know, if I start the day realizing me being a dog walker is a wonderful thing and a very high achievement, and I'm, I'm good with yeah, that. Yeah, good. Yeah. Anything from there is a, bo yeah, is a bonus. Yeah, anything else is, you know, is, is a bonus because <laughs> my dogs like me for doing that. <laughs> Okay, so we've established that you listen to dogs and celebrities find you because they want to be loved by their dogs and they want, you know, they have access to um, innovative things. Yes. And, and you know, I see a lot of celebrities as well. Exactly. And I think that's one of the reasons. So, but a normal person could call you and say, hi, come on over and, you know, I got a problem dog. Yes. Is, do you see mostly problem dogs or do you just, somebody says, hey, I want to train my dog? You know, it's really funny. I see two, two type of clients. Either the client that I'm either the seventh person they went to, the 11th person they went to, or I see puppies. I really prefer to start with puppies because what I do, I do not do dog training. What I do is I look holistically at the dog and I'm saying, where are the red flags? That if I'm not going to take care of it when they are young, that's the only reason to get a puppy, because puppies are a pain in the neck. If they were not cute, nobody would get a puppy. That's true. Okay, they're really a pain in the neck. Grown-up dogs usually don't like puppies. So when I get a puppy, it's because I want to catch the red flag when it's young, so it will not develop and we can eradicate it. Or I get those with the dogs being already traumatized under the guise of dog training with prong colors with choke chain where the person needs to be the master and the owner, the dog needs to be submissive and all of that nonsense. I call that the Saddam Hussein method of governing, you know, where you are in charge and the dog has to be submissive. I adhere more to the Gandhi way of governing, which you said, I'm just a dog walker. If you remember Gandhi, he was just making, you know, weaving all day, that, yeah. that, like, you know, so I adhere more to the Gandhi's way of doing things where he took a nation that was really third world, didn't know how to read or write and empowered them to be more powerful, the strongest empire at the time, the British Empire. My job is not to put a dog down. My job is to show the dog how to make the best decision possible, meaning not to be impulsive and instead to regulate the emotions and how to think. I wish somebody taught me that as a young kid. I wish as a society we would learn that, not, not, not to be so triggered, you know, by somebody cutting us in traffic, by somebody criticizing us or, or whatever. So I teach it to a dog from a young age. When they come to me at a later age, I change the diet. I work with them on what, you know, literally to create a new neural pathway in the brain, meaning not to go on what God's given impulsive way. I literally teach them and practice with them how to think and to connect with me, the mom, the dog mom, for feedback. The way you teach a kid, when your kid wants something and they look at you and you go, or you go, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I narrate every aspect of the dog's life. I built an unbelievable secure attachment, it's called, in psychology, it's the way you do it with young children, mm -hmm. because the more you have a good, secure attachment, the more resourceful they are when they grow up. So I do it either with a young puppy or with an older dog. And when you go on my website, on the testimonials, I sometimes blown away when they give a testimony and say, yeah, tomorrow was the 11th person we came to. And after one session, I couldn't touch the dog. Now I'm kissing the dog in the face. And I'm like, I was the 11th? Because I don't come in from a place of, I know, let me tell you. I come from a place, look, I developed a protocol. I've been doing it for over 30 years. Let's give it a shot if the protocol is going to work for you. And it blows me away and humbles me how often the not, it does work. But it's a lot of homework for the people. And I said, please said it. It took a lot of homework. I don't have a magic dust. You have to follow what I'm telling you. 
So you give them a little uh, handout and say, okay. They write down in their handwriting as we're going through the session. Because as you know, when you write down, you remember. That's very so true. So I use everything that is available for them to be a partner. So it's the dog and them and me. We are like the three legs of the stool. We become a partnership. We are going to be there for you, but you need to be there for your dog. Because if you're not, there's nothing I can help you. It's kind of like they can come to you, but if they're not following, you know, what can you do? Right. And so many people, same thing. I see a lot of people who have been to you know, 11, 12 right? doctors, universities, and they're labeled with something. And, uh, you know, I'm the kind of the last person. Yes. Um, recently saw uh, a young actress, who I won't mention her name, who had been diagnosed with idiopathic uticaria. All of a sudden, she would get huge rashes on her face, on her legs, for no apparent reason. And literally had been, her parents who were in the show business, had the resources to take her all over the world. Diagnosed as idiopathic uticaria it means we don't know. We don't know. Yes, well, that's what it means. Yes. And so I talked to her on the phone. And I said, "Well, I'll see you in Santa Barbara, and in the meantime, I want you to start, you know, the plant paradox." Yes. And two weeks later, she hmm. and her boyfriend walk in, and she had sent me pictures of what she looked like, and it was actually pretty scary. And she said, "They're all gone. All all my <laughs> rashes <laughs> are gone because you know <laughs> in walks this beautiful woman with no rashes." Yeah. And I'm going, now this is a come Yes. On. She says, it's all gone. Yes. Now, how did you know? Everybody else didn't know. And I said, look, I've been doing this a long time. And it's usually people at the end of a long journey like yourself. And, you know, I, I didn't get off the turnip truck yesterday. Sort of thing. <laughs> uh, yes. So you're right. Um, I think there is some fundamental things that are missing. Yes. In how we train our dogs and yes. how we teach people to eat. Yes. So. That's a good segue. You said you changed the dog's diet. Yeah. Okay, how do we feed our dogs? Huge question. And should we watch these commercials on TV? Uh, you should feed the dogs what you eat. You should eat, give them healthy whole grains. Well, what do we do? Okay, so there is science. Are we adhering to science or are we adhering to commercial, to marketing? And what I tell people is do not read what the big says. I do not care what the big says. Here's the sad part. I teach veterinarian students behavior. I go in a lecture in Cal Poly in the holistic program. My friend, Dr. Uh, Barbara Royal, she used to be the president of the Holistic Veterinarian Association. I wrote the forward to her book. Mm -hmm. So she invited me to come and um, teach in her program. So I said, show me what this, the veterinarian students learn as far as nutrition. And they have three days, and guess who teaches them? The people who sell them the commercial dog food. Yep. Now here's the other problem that I have. When you look at the biggest hospital chain, it's VCA. Who owns VCA? Who bought VCA last year for $9 billion? Do you know who did? No, who? Mars. Oh. Mars Company, who makes, I believe, seven out of the 11 commercial foods. And the problem is, if you remember years ago, they found out that what that McDonald's sells what's called pink slime, that yep. it was okay for people to eat. Do you remember years yep. ago? Yep. If pink slime, which was they're picking up what's on the floor and they were bleaching it and putting it in a hamburger, yep. okay for people. What do you think goes then for dog food? Because there's no way they put the qualities that they put on the label and it's that cheap. Just use common sense. It cannot be that inexpensive, the dog food. And yet, it's better than McDonald's. Do you understand what I'm right, saying? Right, right. So if McDonald's give pink slimes, okay, what do you feed your dog? So to me, you cannot feed that to your dog. You cannot put garbage in your dog's body. You cannot follow the nonsense that we've been taught of, never change your dog's food, never give human food. What do you think dog food is made out of? Human food and dog food is made out of the same stuff. There's no human food trees versus <laughs> dog True. food trees, all right? So what it is, is I invite people, whether they work with me with behavior, with training, when it comes with food, let's bring it down to common sense. We know the dog's body is very similar to human body. They get most of the same diseases. Mm -hmm. Then let's do the right way. Let's feed them the right way. So my dogs eat raw diet. 
that do not get carbohydrates. I mean, there's carbohydrates in vegetables and stuff sure. that is okay, but they're not gonna get, of course they're not gonna get grains, but they're not also gonna get no potato, no peas, no, <laughs> no garbanzo beans, no tapioca, none of these things. Just July 12th, the FDA came out with a warning that shows, as you know, but the heart condition, the dogs are now dying like flies by age five. Because what happens, all these non-grain food, they are not got rid of the grain and put more meat. They put other substitutes to keep the price and the margins that they need to make for the shareholders intact. So what happens, you are now feeding your dog something that causes heart conditions. Yeah. Yeah. So you cannot Going do grain that. free. Going grain free. And what it is, is a lot of veterinarians, they cannot say it, number one, because they don't know it. Nobody taught them. Number two, they are part of VCA. VCA wants you to sell that food. And, and they're afraid also that somebody gonna go against them. Because, you know, I'm a dog trainer. I'm a measly, nobody dog trainer. And I can say it because you cannot take, you know, my, my license away. I can tell you what my belief system is. Right. I can send you to literature where you can read and make your own decision. If this doesn't agree with you, that's okay. But I think you and me know that oftentimes when you go to regular doctors, they're gonna tell you Dr. Gandhi is crazy or they tell me Tamar is crazy. Eating sugar all day got nothing to do with behavior. Kibble is balanced food. I said kibble is not balanced food, it's sugar. Yeah. You cannot give sugar and not have brain fog. You cannot have sugar and, and be able to, you know, I know it for myself. Sure. So I'm very, as you can tell, outspoken, and I can tell you a lot of people don't like me, but I have to do what's right for me. Somebody came to me recently, and they sold their own cable company for hundreds of millions of dollars, and the non-compete is over, and they're about to do a new one with probiotics. And they said, come do it with us. And I said, I can't, I can't. And I said, and he said, let me give you to the formulator, He's a scientist. And I said, great, I would love to because God, there's gonna be so much money I could make and we all need to make a living. It would be lovely to make money, but I can't do something that goes against my, against my consciousness. So I'm talking to the formulator, he's a scientist, and nothing makes sense. And I said to him, I need to ask you after 45 minutes of conversation, I said, I need to ask you, Dr. So-and-so, um, when was the research done that you are referring to? And he goes, 1997. And I go, but do you know, Dr. So-and-so, that since then we have a lot of, of research done about gut and microbiome, and, microbiome, microbiome yeah. and everything. And he goes, I don't believe in that. And I said, sadly, I would not be able to partner. And I really love the man. He's a good man. He does a lot of good of work in the rescue world that I would love to part with that man. But unfortunately, he gets the wrong information from the scientists. Mm -hmm. And I had to walk away. So it is that important for people and for dogs, for longevity and for quality of life to eat healthy. I'm sorry, this is just not two ways about it. So raw diet, vegetables, particularly green vegetables, bone broth, all those things, you know, that are about health. Yeah, I was amazed recently, I came across um, a website from a major uh, university veterinary program in the Midwest and they have huge amounts of funding. They just got 20 million or 12 million? Uh, uh, yeah, and like even, a month yeah, ago? Yeah, and from the company who makes the dog food? Yeah. Yes. And the uh, they they actually have very interesting guides that they believe that uh, grains are an essential part of a dog's diet. Uh, and Unbelievable. meat byproducts are actually incredibly important and there's nothing wrong with them. And I'm going, wow, you know, this is a major university. And so I I start digging through Freedom yeah. of Information Act, yeah. and their major one of their major yeah. donors is the Ralston Purina Company. Yeah, Ralston, I saw Purina, it. Yeah, and it's like, and you have to dig to find these donors. There's nothing on their websites. That's exactly right. Yeah, uh, and and so here's this you know disinformation from yes. a major university. Yes, who you know I would trust. They have a really of good course. football team. <laughs> of and, course, and yet. They're getting their funding from the very people. That I mean, it's, 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 come on, don't we all know, we also on 60 Minutes, the pharmaceutical company. You know, that so many physicians get their education from the people who sell oh, them the true. drug, right? It's, it's true. And it's not that different. And 
People think of dog's longevity is, oh my God, my dog is old, he's 12 or he's 13. No, your dog is old is when he's 17 or he's in their 20s. Kind of like people used to die when they're 60s or 70s, now sure. people live longer. It's kind of like, but you see, it's very difficult. You and me are kind of like in the same. And, and you see so many dogs running around with, you know, the collar of shame <laughs> and arthritis and they're not supposed to have eczema. They're not no. supposed to have rashes. No. And they're not supposed to be on steroids no. for this. No. Uh, you know, and they're not supposed to be on ibuprofen. And absolutely. Absol absolutely. Or gabapenting day in, day out for the rest of their life. I mean, you cannot do all these things without having side effects. And you see, I'm looking that I'm here to serve dogs. So in any way that I can. Great. So do your personal choices in food affect your dog health, do you think? Well, of course, because, you know, when I make myself steamed broccoli, my dogs stand around, when are we getting my steamed broccoli? You know, when I'm opening a bag of kale, my dogs love raw kale, you know? So it's kind of like, I don't have garbage at my home. I don't have crap food at my home. So that's what my dogs are eating and they're loving it. Well, I, I, I made this observation years ago during the spring. My dogs, whenever there were young shoots of grass or young yes. leaves, they'd stop and munch yes. them. Not to throw up. No, no of Mature not. leaves, they'll throw up. Um, and I said, that's interesting. Yes. Now, what are they eating all this green stuff for? Yes. And you studied wolves. And one of yes. the things we know about great carnivores is they'll eat the guts of the animal they kill first. And they Number eat, one. And that's where all the vegetable product was. And so- Fermented. Yeah, and they were Fermented. lacking that vegetable product that would have been a normal part of their diet. 100%. And I'm going, Huh. They're, you know, they're, they're good carnivores. They're great predators. And exactly. I'm, and eating dirt. Yeah. And I'm not giving them that in their diet. So I started giving them, you know, 100%. kale and lettuce and they love a good piece of lettuce. Absolutely. My dogs love my Mediterranean salad with the olive oil. Yeah. And absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how about omega threes for dogs? Fish oil. I love omega three. And I recommend omega-3 that has 60% EPA and 40% DHA based on research that was done for the best of uh, brain. Because mm -hmm. I like to look at my brain and study my brain. How can I make my brain the best tool that I can have? Uh, because stress bring my brain down and dogs are under a lot of stress. So I'm, my dogs get omega-3 every day. I don't think your dogs are under stress. So. <laughs> <laughs> they do because you know what? My dogs like to be my only dogs and I always have dogs coming in and out of my home. Ah. My clients come to my home and we do like a therapy session. We sit in my kitchen and we really, it's a beautiful environment because we, I get to expedite the, the puppy that comes to me or the client dog who come to see when they're getting triggered, when they see other dogs. So I don't have to do it. It's kind of like learning a language. You can learn to speak French in a school, in a class, or you can go learning to speak French in Paris. You expedite it if you're gonna do it in Paris. So I ask my clients to come to me, and then we're doing it with other dogs around. So I always have dogs coming in and out, and my personal dogs are my helpers. Mm. So I think they would prefer to be sometimes just, mom, can we just be your dogs? We don't want you to give your time to other dogs. So I think it's stressful for them sometimes. So do they act territorial? No, it's not about territorial, but I can see that just like looking at me. You know how to read their faces when you have a dog and they go like, really? Can't we just be just us? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's part of what I do, you know? So what do you say to all the dog trainers out there that this is a power struggle, that you have to be the master and your dog has to submit and that's how you train a dog? I would say, welcome to the 1950s. If you think our dog training started, it started after Second World War. And that's why dogs, are when they are healing, they're on the left side. Why is that? because the rifle was on the right side. Last time I checked, none of us walking around with rifles. Most of us are right-handed. Most dogs are left-handed. And I look at that, that the divine intelligence did it so the dogs can be with their strong side, the dog hemisphere of the brain next to our strong, so we can connect, so we can bond. 
When I teach dogs how to work on the, white si on the right side, and I give them the option, that side or this side, because I always test. Everything that I do with a dog, with each individual, I test. Which one would you prefer? It's always that coming to this side, when I give them the option, when they've not been trained before to do that. So what I tell people is, we are not in the 1950s. We have behavioral research that is available to us that shows that when you teach a dog how to make decisions, just the way you teach a kid to empower them to make good decisions, they become better individual and they become devoted to you. Like Tony Robbins says, you want a raving fan. We are all looking for a raving fan in our dogs. We may not always get a raving fan in our spouse or in our children. They have their own journey. But the one being in our life that we can have as a raving fan is our dog. And unfortunately, people get a dog because they want that, and then they go to a trainer who breaks the dog's spirit and breaks that unbelievable bond, unbelievable trust, unbelievable connection and faith that you are the best human for me that dogs wants to feel. So I really would like to make it, just like it was done with children raising, that you know, it's not okay to hit your children, it's not okay to do this. I would like to change it, that it's not okay to use prong collars on dogs. You know, just think about it. If I'm gonna tell you now a word in Hebrew, and you are not gonna do it, and I'm gonna put a prong collar that digs into your neck, and by the way, no, mother's dog do not use correction on dogs, and certainly, not like that. You know, um, if I'm teaching you a word in Hebrew and you're not doing it and I'm gonna hurt you, would it make you wanna learn from me more? I might learn faster. You're not, <laughs> because when you're stressed, as you know, no, you actually learn less, because you know what happened to your body when you're stressed. Right. Cortisol goes up, this is not the time to learn. So it's, uh, do you, can we give treats to our dogs Absolutely. in the learning process? Absolutely. Absolutely. But what I do, I don't teach dog a command. I present a situation for a dog, and I want a dog to think. And I'm zipping it and waiting. And if the dog is doing it wrong, I'm just keep looking. When he's doing it right, I use the Las Vegas method, the jackpot. And what it is, the dog realizes, oh my God, when I do that, it's so much pleasure. And I show them because I come from a place of respect, that they're sentient being, that they're mammals, that they, need, that they can think, and it's up to me to be a good teacher, to bring the most out of them. And what kind of treat? Uh, protein or, or green vegetables. Yeah. Yes, okay. that's it. I make my own, you know, I don't go and buy treats because it just, uh, you know, I want it that I make it. I want them to feel the dogs that I cooked for them. It's all about design, about I'm here to serve you, Mr. Doggy, and the dog parent. I'm here to serve them. And that's why I cook for them and they have different types and they are all living like, oh my God, we can't wait to come back. And that's what I want people to feel and dogs to feel. So can dogs save your life? I think so. We have again studies and study of people who were depressed, you know, uh, completely like in a dark energy place and you bring a dog even just from visiting them anyway to living with them and there's like a flower, there's something opens up. Dogs to me are the closest thing to that divine energy that people call God or whatever, because they're really all about, they want to give love, they want to connect, they don't have ulterior motives. No, they don't. They're no. pure. Yeah. They're pure. And I, you know, I told you off camera, I give people prescriptions to get a yes. dog. I actually write them on a prescription pad. Yes. And a number of my patients have, have come back uh, saying, you know, that's the first prescription a doctor ever gave me that you that worked. Yes. And it, it's really true. In fact, somebody sent me the, the prescription frame uh, <laughs> recently, a, a picture of it. So. But you see, but you are a cardiologist. What's the best thing to a heart? Love. Yeah, that's What's exactly right. What's the most pure right. form of love? Yeah. A dog. Yeah, that's very true. And uh, let's not leave out cats. Uh, 
I love cats. I just don't know them. Yeah, I, I had a cat in medical school. Having a dog in medical school does not work. Um, they demand too much. Well, yeah, you, you know, you're often on call in the hospital yes. days at a time, and a cat can go, that's okay. I, I, I got this. You know, I can care for myself. So, uh, so please, folks, if you have a cat, I, I've had a cat. I loved my cat. Uh, this is a dog show today, but cats uh, can be incredibly useful uh, pets. As well as birds, I used to have a bird. Miss my bird, so. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, dogs are, are really special. Okay, so uh, we're going to wrap it up. As you know, we do an audience question, and I'm actually going to include you on this. So today's question comes from Barb. Barb writes in: Can we eat coconut oil or extra virgin olive oil in phase one and phase two of your program? You know, I get this a lot. So here's the deal: in phase one. Almost everybody in the world, at least in America, has a leaky gut. Get over it. What happens when you have a leaky gut is we're trying to keep, among other things, bacterial particles called lipopolysaccharides, LPSs. And as you know, I don't swear, but I call them little pieces of shit in the book because that's what they are. These things ride through our gut wall on saturated fats. Unfortunately, like coconut oil, they will also ride on olive oil. And everybody goes, well, Dr. Gundry, you love olive oil and coconut oil is okay for most people. And that's true. But in phase one, I really want to seal your gut. And so I want to try to keep these guys out of you. Now, interesting, we've talked about fish oil and omega-3. It turns out that fish oil actually seals your gut, and these little guys can't ride in on fish oil. So early on, yeah, just go easy. You don't have to avoid it, but it's not the leader of olive oil that I want you eventually to get to. Uh, once we seal your gut and we calm down your gut microbiome and get a lot of good bugs rather than bad bugs, then it's fine. You've heard me talk about before that if you have the ApoE4 gene, which is unfortunately nicknamed the Alzheimer's gene, and 30% of us carry that gene. If you have that, I want you to be cautious with the amount of coconut oil that you use. Probably MCT oil is different, but I don't have enough data to prove that yet. But coconut oil, coconut oil if you're an ApoE4, not your best choice of, of fats. So, can we give our dogs coconut oil? I give coconut oil, but very little. I switched from coconut oil, it was the fed, to omega-3 oil yeah. in the last few years. The more I read about coconut oil, the more I realized you have to be cautious with that, and omega-3 is a little bit better. Yeah, I'm testing out a uh, very high polyphenol olive oil that was originally made in Morocco for horses, race horses. And apparently, from the literature I've seen, was really, really useful for helping them recover from races, wow. which is incredible stress on, Very on a racehorse. And so, and my daughter actually rehabs uh, old racehorses. Oh, wow. And so, yeah. So, anyhow, uh, so we're going to try this up. Okay. So, look, it's been great. We've had a wonderful. Uh, metaphysical experience here today. We've covered far more than just dogs. And I can't thank you enough I for coming on the show. you. Pleasure. So I'm Dr. Gundry. You've been watching the Dr. Gundry podcast. Make sure that you sign up for the Plant Paradox 30-Day Challenge. The new book comes out in just a couple days. The challenge is going to start January 15th ends on Valentine's Day, how appropriate. We got 30 days of meals in the new Plant Paradox Quick and Easy. Sign up for the challenge, go to drgundry.com or at Plant Paradox 30. I'm gonna do it even though the day after the start I have to fly to Paris and boy, is that gonna be a challenge. <laughs> so, and I'm gonna Instagram every day about what I'm eating over there. So, till next time, thanks a lot. And tomorrow, thank you very much. My pleasure.